Mora conducts physician-led support groups, helping people live healthier, happier lives, free from chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. And on our podcast, Health and Mora with Dr. Lori Marbus, we bring to you nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests to empower and inspire you with their knowledge and stories of plant-based lifestyle so that you can be your healthiest self. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and today I'm really honored to welcome Maxim Sigoin. I hope I said that right. How are you today? Good. You did. You did really well. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, we're going to get into your story, but you're basically a a vegan coach. You help people with body composition transformations, some great testimonials on your website. So we'll get to that. But there's always a wonderful story behind where someone is when I'm sitting and talking to them. And I never want to neglect that because I feel that's where people will resonate and connect with you. And I think you have a lot to offer just in, in your story. And I'm excited to learn even more than I've already kind of briefly understand. So tell us a little bit about kind of your journey into health and um, yeah, let's start there. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you. I'll start to slightly before I transitioned to eating plant-based, you know, so I grew up on a farm. We were nice rednecks, right? We were just farmers. Like we, we had chickens, <laughs> cows, geese, horses. Like we lived on 140 acres of land, but we were the farmers. Like we killed our own chicken for meat. We got the eggs every day. And so I didn't come from the world near veganism. Like my dad used to make fun of vegans for eating like blocks of plastic, which now I know is this, this tofu, which is delicious. Um, and so coming, coming from that world, I fell heavy into, you know, meat eating, bodybuilding. And I was always a skinny fat kid growing up. Um, and you know, with a shirt, I look really skinny with a shirt off. I didn't feel so confident. So I was like, you know what? I need to build muscle. That's what's going to help me have confidence. And so I got into bodybuilding. I got into training and I went from one summer, I went from 160 pounds to 240 pounds by the time I kind of started college at that point, I just 5,000 calories that I just got really big, but consuming a lot of meat products. And, you know, I competed in bodybuilding I did powerlifting. I did all of these things. And then fast forward a few years of me being into this world, I was training with a friend and he was giving me a ride back um, to, to my, to my house ultimately. And he's like, I need to stop by a friend's place. Um, and I was like, oh, cool. You're driving. I can't, I can't say no. So we get to his <laughs> friend's place. We open the door. It's an apartment and there's a runway in the apartment, like a modeling show runway. And I was like, what kind of friend do you have here? It's, like, oh, it's my, it's my modeling agent. And so he was getting some comp cards for his shows. And she saw me, she's like, I see something under those big chubby cheeks, right? I was 240 pounds, looked like a chipmunk. I was really bulked up. <laughs> and uh, I was like, okay. She's like, well, try losing some weight and then we'll do a photo shoot and see how it goes. And I was like, I was thinking of doing a modeling, uh, not a modeling, a fitness modeling competition. I was like, I'm going to lean out anyways. It's fine. I'll just lose some weight, do a photo shoot, how it goes. Did a photo shoot, booked a job, made some money. I was like, I can get paid by people taking photos of me. Like, this is, I'm working at Subway. Like, this is great. Like, why do I have to do more of this? And then- <laughs> She told me, he's like, you just, you're just too muscular, you're too big for the shoot. You're six, four. So I was made for like, for my height, you do runway, right. For the mm. high fashion shows, like you're too big. I so you need to get skinnier. I was like, man, I've, I've been working a long time to be this big. And so I was like, you know what? I've tried, I've tried bodybuilding. I've tried, I've tried all these things. Let me just try this new thing. So I went on Google. I was like, what diet's going to allow me to get skinny as fast as possible. The veganism showed up. Vegans are skinny and weak. I'm like, well, I don't care if I'm weak. I just need to be skinny ultimately. So <laughs> went vegan the next day, right? I transitioned from eating a dozen eggs for breakfast, three chicken breasts every two hours for five meals a day. I was eating a chicken farm every day. Ultimately, the next wow. day, my breakfast was a bowl of frozen blueberries, dates, and bananas. All right. That was like immediate shift. <laughs> and uh, it was it was an interesting shift, interesting journey. My fiber went from like 10 grams to 70 grams a day. It was, it was an interesting shift. I was hard on the gut at first, but... <laughs> As I transition, I managed to lose 80 pounds in my first year of going vegan. But again, I did everything to lose muscle, right? I Mm. stopped strength training. I just did cardio. I ate very little calories. I didn't eat any protein. And then I I got really skinny ultimately, which is what I needed to do to to work. Mm. And, you know, I was able to work in in Milan, Italy. I worked in Germany. I've worked in New York. I was able to kind of travel a little bit with it. So it was a fun time of my life to experiment, experience that. But as I kind of started to want to learn more, because I was like, I don't know what to eat besides fruits and vegetables. I don't know what else is vegan. I just knew what I couldn't eat. I didn't know what I could eat. 
And then I found Forks Over Knife, the documentary, and I watched that. And they talked about the connection between health and cancer and heart disease and the foods that you're eating. And it was around that time that my grandfather got diagnosed with cancer. And then I was like, wow, there's, I can see the connection now, right? He's, he, he showed me that his favorite snack was Wonder Bread, toasted Wonder Bread with melted butter and Nutella. That was like his thing. So just to tell you how he was eating before. Uh, and so I made the connection and unfortunately ended up passing away like a few months after being diagnosed. It wasn't too long. And to me, that really sealed it. of like, man, this is the way to eat, right? Like this is the way to eat. And I became like a hardcore activist, right? I like, I'm trying to save my friends. I'm trying to save my parents. I'm trying to save everyone. I think we all have that phase when we go vegan, which is yeah. like the savior phase. Uh, <laughs> eventually you get out of it, but that, that kind of what sealed it for me of like, this is the way that I need to be eating. And then fast forward a few years, you know, I, I, I did modeling for a bit and then I meet my ex-partner. She gets diagnosed with breast cancer within three years of us meeting. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Like, I love her. I'm going to stay. Right. And when she got diagnosed, she was like vegetarian. She wasn't eating vegan before. And I was like, you, you, need, like, you need to do a whole food plant base. Right. It just makes sense. And for her, it made sense as well, because she's like, when I feel sick, I go back to eating fruits and veggies. And when I'm going back to my normal life, then I'm eating all of the other shit foods. It's just like, it just makes sense for me to go whole food plant-based. Yeah. So she transitioned, inflammatory markers went down, the tumor started to shrink. The doctor gave her one year to live. She ended up living almost five years. And which I may say was pretty good quality of life. Like we travel, we did activities, we did all these things. And so, you know, unfortunately she ended up passing away over two years ago. Um, but having seen firsthand what it's like, to lose your health, right? Because you know, my grandfather was sick, but I wasn't by his side 24-7. But to be by someone's side 24-7 for almost five years, screaming in the middle of the night, the cancer treatments, the stress from finances and kind of all of these things, I was like, I don't want anyone else to have to go through that. And to me, it just made sense. I'm like, if you eat a whole food plant-based diet and you exercise mildly and have just a healthy body, you don't need to have a six pack. You don't need to be the biggest person and do Ironmans. Like you just need to have a healthy body. You greatly reduce your risk of all these chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I embarked on this journey of coaching people. And I set my initial mission, which I'm still on now, which is to help 10,000 people get lean, thrive, and disease proof their bodies on plants by 2033 which is the age that I will be when she passed away because she was like, you know, over 12 years older than me at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went trying to save or help 10,000 people by that, by that point. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how I got to where I'm at. And that's my, my whole health journey ultimately. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Goodness. Well, I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sure that's a, that's a difficult Thank you. Um, situation and to be by someone's side when they're suffering and then make that your life's journey. So you're taking the good out of something that was so painful. So that's wonderful. I love that. Um, well, we are similar missions then, right? Is reaching and helping people and, uh, you know, focusing on that foundation of a whole food plant-based diet. So could we go into, because I get this question by everybody. If I don't ask, I might as well just mm -hmm. get it now. It's a great segue. What do you eat in a day? And then we can get into your activities and, you know, what you've seen with people. And there's so many stories I'm sure that we'll, we'll jump into, but yeah. So what do you eat in a day? Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I typically start off the day with like just a big green antioxidant rich smoothie, right? I'll have some, you know, some, some unsweet nut milk in there or something. I'll just use like Berkeley, uh, Berkey water. Uh, I have bananas, some frozen mixed berries, some spinach, some dark, some kale in there, maybe some chard. Uh, we'll throw a little bit of like nut butter in there because I'm I'm in a muscle building phase. So I need a bit more calories, you know, uh, bananas and a little bit of protein powder in there. Typically, it'll be a breakfast and that'll set me uh, sometimes oatmeal in there as well. It'll set me about a thousand calories because I don't like to eat that much throughout the day. So I need to get really big meals. Yeah. For lunch, it'll be some type of grain, like a quinoa or rice or something like that with a mix of vegetables and tofu, some tempeh, maybe some edamame for the lunch. Again, trying to mass it up to almost a thousand calories for the whole meal. And then for dinner, it's whatever my fiance and I want, want to eat um, because I like to have kind of that freedom at nighttime of not always eating the same thing. And so it'll be a protein source, a bunch of vegetables and a different grain, right? Mm. I, I just realized that as you progress in veganism, I'm sure you notice a lot of your meals are either like a Buddha bowl, a, a stir fry is a cooked Buddha bowl. That's basically what it is, right? So you do a stir fry, <laughs> a Buddha bowl, a sandwich, a salad. Like there's not too many variations of the dish. You just change the ingredients within it ultimately. Right, right, right. 
No, I hear you. I, I love soy curls. Like that is, I can put that in anything and everything. <laughs> um, absolutely love those things, but yeah, it's your, I start my, I can't remember the morning. I haven't had a, a smoothie. I put uh, greens and I even put cabbage. I put, um, broccoli slaw. I put uh, rice cauliflower frozen because it makes it creamier. I use soy milk. Yeah. Um, I put bananas, pineapple, frozen blueberries, cherries. There's one other thing. Oh, and then I put like, I do put some protein powder, but I use the um, uh, Garden of Life, like raw miller pussy because it has a tons of vitamins and all this extra good stuff. And I am like you, I eat a lot in the morning. And then in, during the day, it's it's never, never, no. <laughs> there's yeah, meetings, there's travel. There's, there's, there's meetings, calls, yeah. <laughs> there's like, oh yeah, I forgot to eat. <laughs> um, so that's kind of, I, I totally appreciate that. No, I, I feel like I could talk to meals and food with people all day long, but, um, but we'll move on. So tell us um, now, so you're, you said you were putting on muscle. Are you doing more bodybuilding now? Like what is, what is your intent now? Because I see a bicycle here in your background. Um, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. So goals change, to be honest. Um, I was just having a conversation with one of my mentors and I was like, I feel kind of unmotivated to exercise. Like I'm still doing it because it's deeply ingrained into who I am. But when you start to exercise, you're like, I want to get a flat stomach or I want to fit in a certain side of clothes or I want to look a certain way. And then there's kind of this in, internal unspoken expectation of once I get that, then things will be different in my life. I will show up differently as to who I am. It'll solve certain things that I don't want to resolve. And to me, I, I've done it all. Mm. Been 240 pounds. I've been, I use all the words. I've been big, big, I've been jacked. I've been ripped. I've been shredded. I've done Iron Man. I've, I've done all of it. I've done literally all of it with my body. And there was a point halfway through, I was like, none of it is solving what I'm trying to deal with. And I just had to go internally to kind of heal what was there. And once I did that, then I was like, I don't need to be big. I don't need to have a six pack. I don't need to have any of these things. Mm -hmm. And so I feel pretty lucky with where I'm at because a lot of people that are around kind of my age group are still like, I want bigger biceps and I want a six pack. And I'm just like, you know what? I, I want a body where I can feel good, right? I, I don't feel like when I bend over, there's like, you know, 15 different layers of stomach. I just, you know, I just want to feel comfortable in my body. I want to be able to ride my bike if I need to. I want to be able to swim in the ocean. I want to be able to kind of go longboard. I want to play basketball. I want to go run um, and still strength train because I do like the feeling of that. And ultimately, in terms of health benefits, until I'm 100 years old, ultimately, I'm going to keep weight, weight uh, lifting. Mm -hmm. But I'm just trying to feel, continue to feel good, ultimately. Mm -hmm. So I just call my coach. I'm like, I'm done with the muscle building phase. Like, I just, I don't want to do what's necessary to get that big. I just don't care. I just want to feel good. So mm -hmm. the goals change as I progress. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you're just hitting a, a point. Do you mind me asking how old you are? Yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm turning 30 this month. Oh, well, happy birthday. New decade. Thank you. Um, yeah. So having, you know, I'm in my mid fifties and having children that will be 30 next year. <laughs> so yeah. Those pieces, I, I think that just come with with maturity. And as you get into life, right, you're you're finding that you may find that you may want to, I went through a phase of running half marathons every month. I mean, I had teenagers at the time. So, you know, those are things, yeah. but I think you just find a rhythm in your life and you feel comfortable with you and you're just settling in for the long haul and you'll have a new goal, but you'll have a great foundation and base to do anything and everything you desire. So I think that's wonderful. Um, and you yeah. mentioned the healing piece of that. Where do you feel that is important for people who are maybe coming to you and saying, Hey, I want to change my body. Do you, do you guys, you know, you mentioned you guys have some coaches and stuff. Do you speak to any of that or encourage someone? Like how of do you course. have people reflect internally? Cause that's such an important piece, well, at least for my work. That's the, that's the majority of our program, right? <laughs> Not a lot of our program is centered around training nutrition as much as it's a body composition program. So mm -hmm. I always tell members, training nutrition is not the most important part. It is not the factor that will help you to have great body composition because if I give you a plan and we don't stick to it, there's no magic that's going to happen. Nothing is going to change ultimately, right? Same thing when you prescribe someone to a patient. If you don't follow it, there's no magic of like, I own a piece of paper that tells me what to do. Automatically, these things are going to appear. So we focus a lot on mindset and psychology with our members, right? Mm -hmm. Limiting beliefs, self-sabotage, the negative self-talk, the things that kind of show up. Oh my God. And I'm up front with people. I'm like, you have this beautiful goal that you want to do. You probably think that once you're going to get there, it's going to change things. I'm here to tell you that it won't. 
the act of you getting that thing won't change anything, but who you're going to become throughout the process is the thing that's going to change how you're going to feel at the end. That's, that's the part. So I'm like, as you progress, notice the things that are showing up for you, right? I'm doing so well. I deserve to have this thing. I was like, well, if you had to run a marathon and you're tired halfway through, would you move the finish line towards you? Right. And probably not. Right. You're just like, oh, I just have to keep going a little bit more. I'm not there yet. Well, it's the same thing in this in this process. So identify the things that are showing up that are causing you to kind of want to move the finish line a little bit earlier out of convenience. And once people reach their end goal, they start to have what I call just true confidence. Right. Mm. Because there's superficial confidence. You can buy nice clothes, watches, card, or purses, whatever. Maybe you can have all of these things. But internally, you're insecure. Like, I hope someone notices the car. I hope someone notices my dress or my shoes or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. But I think true confidence comes when you say that you're going to do something and you actually follow through on it and hit the goal that you want. You just internally, it just changes. Like, now I'm the person that does the thing that they say that they're going to do. And once that's built into your identity, that's true confidence. You start to become so careful about what you take on because like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to win everything. I got to be careful about what I choose. I better choose things that I actually care about. So I think that's like the, the, what we focus on for our members. Mm. No, that's fantastic because I always tell patients, I think the, the one thing we have to get right is what's going on in the three pound organ between your ears, because literally <laughs> that, that will dictate everything else um, for the majority. Yeah. But the negative self-talk is such an important piece. Are you familiar with Dr. Shed Helmstetter by any chance? No, no, so I haven't heard a, of him. You should check him out. He wrote a book, or he's written a lot of books, but um, I've interviewed him on the podcast. He wrote a book, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself. Oh I'm in mm. love with this man. So he's like in his late 70s. I've had him on the podcast. I've had him meet my doctors because he's got that I think is the key. And I think that's why I started this podcast seven years ago was to speak to people who had done it. Like, why were you able to lose 200 pounds? And my other person can't just eat a Mm. a serving of vegetables a day, (laughs) you know, and why were you able to keep it off? And, um, it really is that what you're describing that changing of identity, changing your thoughts, your beliefs, but it all starts with the thinking because that will lead to the actions over, you know, changing your beliefs, changing your and identifying with who you are now and that confidence that comes with that. It's so, so true. Um, And to have this figured out and helping others figure it out is phenomenal. So kudos. I think that's brilliant. Thank Um, you. And so- Surrounding myself with great people, ultimately, right? I just want to kind of add this. You familiar with Tony Robbins is? Oh, yes. I love it. Yeah. So I, uh, I've been in this world for a long time. I just find it finally was in a position to kind of join his platinum partnership mm. where I will get to meet him this year on a few oh, different trips and chat awesome. with him. And so I'm very excited. In August, I'm going to meet him. I'm like, like a little girl. I'm so excited <laughs> to kind of like meet up with him. Um, but ultimately, you know, if there was a superpower I could have, it would be to be able to go in people's brain and kind of turn on that switch of like, Hey, you have cancer, but there's no negative side effect to it. It's just a realization that you have cancer. You just had a, a heart attack, whatever it may be. If I can turn on that switch, Like that's a superpower I would want. And the only Mm. person I found that was that close to being able to turn that on into people is through conversation is Tony Robbins. And so that's why like I bought his courses and studying his things. I kind of hired his team to try and identify how do I create that through conversation? Because if you can turn that on into someone, regardless of what the plan is, whatever the circumstances are, it's game over. They're going to stick through with it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting as I, I agree with you 100%. Tony Robbins is phenomenal. Um, I bought like all of his, you know, the financial ministries that made my children read their books. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm, yeah. I'm a, I, I geek out over Tony Robbins and I would love to hear how the meeting goes. That's just, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, he has a really unique style and his basically invention of coaching, right? And when you look yeah. over the, his long life and his, his life story is quite remarkable in and of itself. So that piece is really important to know that I think there's going to be people who self-select. So, cause I came yeah. from, I'm a family medicine physician. So my, you know, been a doctor for 20 plus years. And the piece that I found is I can have the same conversation, you know, message differently, depending on their goals and different things. Some people are just ready to receive and others won't. So I think people who seek you and me out for our services mm-hmm. are already going to have that piece ready to be turned on. So I think they're like, it's primed almost. But what's interesting though, is even when you meet someone who wasn't even aware that they might be ready, 
it's how you message it to make them aware of like there is hope. So I I like to refer to ourselves as prescribers of hope. And I think that's the piece that Tony does so well yeah, is yeah. changing what people's perception of the future is. And when you can do mm. that and they can see it and believe it, that's when they start having internal decisions, thoughts differently. And I think that's what it is, at least in my conversations with thousands of patients and what I hear from people that work with other people. Um, but I'd love to hear what you learn. And if you discover some secret skill, please let me yeah. know because I need to further well, there's, investigate there's that. A there's a tool that he used it calls it the dickens process dickens process mm. and so you know a lot of as humans we're not as much as we want to we're not driven by the shiny object right because right. if we were we'd all be successful we're driven by running away from pain automatically that's why the cancer moment the heart attack moment is so powerful to most people mm. losing everything it's kind of when people rebuild themselves mm. and so dickens process he basically just grabs like identify a limiting belief uh, a, a limiting thought that you have and then he makes you fully embody it. And he goes like, okay, let's grab this. And let's imagine you live like this for the next year, right? You're just continuing to live this limiting thought that you have, this limiting belief that you have. You live as if this is true for the next year. How would your life be, right? Feel it and like embody it, envision it. All right, let's do five mm -hmm. years, redo it. And then he propels you to like 20, 30, 40 years from now. And then you're like... Fuck, this is painful, right? He's like, I probably lost my partner. I'm probably probably very sick. I probably lost everything, probably very unhealthy. And then, mm -hmm. you know, we kind of create that pain because our body doesn't know whether it's self-created or it's actually happening, right? In a lot of the mm -hmm. cases. And so people get anxious just from their thoughts. And so by self-creating that pain internally, then it brings you back and goes like, okay, well, just for you to know, none of this happened, right? And that's only a glimpse of what it would actually be like in the future. So now what do you think is a new, more empowering thought that you can have and your new empowering belief that you can have, right? And he does the same process over to kind of just ingrain it into your system, right? Mm -hmm. But how would you, how great would your life be? Live it, embody it, feel it into your body and propel. So you kind of like seal it into like your nervous system. Mm -hmm. So that's a cool process. I've done it multiple times with our, our, our members and it just, mm -hmm. at the end of like, wow, right? I can't believe I was going to live my life like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really interesting. So you're basically showing it on two projections, right? They're, they're creating their own life story on a screen. And then you're saying, okay, we're going back to reality and let's look at the other options. So it literally is the same idea. That's awesome. So yeah. the Dickens process. Okay. Yeah. Got a new, new thing to look up and share with the docs. Cause we're always trying to um, learn how we can become better because it's, it's simple, right? There are six pillars of lifestyle medicine. I can tell you, like you said, yeah. here's the data. Here's what you need to do but it's that behavior piece and the discussion. So, you know, they become better quote unquote coaches, but at the same time, you know, decreasing medications, prescribing labs, all those things. Um, no, I think that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. Wow. And, that, and that's an indicator of a good coach because a lot of people will just be like, here's the data. This is why you should do it. And then you just stop there. Not everyone's willing to go above and beyond like you and I are, yeah. because that's the hard part, right? Is we all have these, these little layers of blocks of trauma or things that happened in our past that we've put in front of us. And for some reason, we think that we need to add on to it to kind of resolve the issues that we have. Mm. But in reality, if you were to just literally just be yourself and who you truly are and literally not care what everyone else thinks, you would be able to be successful in whatever it is that you want. So it's not about adding layers. It's about removing the layers that are preventing you from you being you so that you can like shine automatically and do the things that you're passionate about mm -hmm. no it's a hundred percent and it's the language that we speak to ourselves is a lot of the like you said the limiting behavior the limiting beliefs come from that language that we're speaking to ourselves and that's what i think you'll like yeah. with dr shed helmsetter um is because he has a really cool app and it's called self-talk plus and so basically it's based on you know what your desires and uh, goals would be, let's say if it's weight loss or living a more positive life or whatever, he basically gives you like five to 10 minutes of, of statements that are said in present tense that you can just play in the mm -hmm. background. And it's some really fun stuff um, that reading his book and stories and, but you just start hearing it. You start hearing the chatter, you know, when we're sitting, you're trying to meditate or do whatever, yeah. you're just sitting with your thoughts, that chatter changes because I play them too. Cause I, I love listening to it. Um, Anyway, yeah, it's 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 fantastic. But 
you're changing the limiting beliefs is 100%. Huh, this is great. Oh my goodness. I could geek out on this stuff all day. Um, <laughs> so what is it, what does the process look like for, let's say someone who contacts you and wants to engage with your services? What, what is the journey of that person? Yeah, of course. So the, the journey is custom to everyone, but ultimately there's four core pillars that we kind of take everyone through just because that's what I found to be successful in myself for the past, you know, 18 years of my, I was just like transfer my body at will. And I always put a disclaimer on this. Don't look at me for being fit. I'm 30, right? Like it's super easy for me to be fit. Don't look at me. Like that. Just look at the 650 plus people that we have between 40 and 80 years old that are fit, right? right people look right. at me. It's like, I want to be like you. It's unfair. I'm 30, right? You're 60. <laughs> look at other 60 year olds that we help transform. You get a more accurate representation of what we can do. So, right. um, the, basically the four things is we want to lose the weight the first place, right? We want to do body recomposition. So body recomposition, people that are not too familiar with it. A lot of people say weight loss. So weight loss is just a number on the scale dropping. It could be muscle. It could be fat, right? So if you just lose weight, you could just end up looking like a skinnier, fluffier version of yourself, which mm -hmm. most people don't want. Mm -hmm. So body composition is you have two variable fat and muscle. We want to increase the muscle, decrease the fat one. That's basically a body composition. Super simple to explain. Hard, a little bit harder to do, but simple to explain. So we want to do the body recomposition. Typically, we grab about 20 pounds per four months of fat loss, right? Just because I tell people, most people are used to hearing like 20 pounds in a month, lose the weight in 30 days. But here's the thing. The faster the calorie deficit, right? Your body, you have to understand your body is just a survival machine, right? It's just there to adapt. It doesn't care that you're trying to lose weight. It doesn't care you're trying to build muscle. It doesn't care you're trying to fit in your dress. It just wants to survive. So it goes, okay, we're eating less energy. There's all this energy output. If we continue at the strand, we're going to die 10 years early because we're going to run out of resources, right? So what does your body do? It adjusts, slows down the metabolism, but it also starts to let go of things that are not necessary, right? Or that costs a lot of energy. Muscle costs a lot of energy to maintain, and you can be really skinny and live a long time. So you don't need a lot of muscle to survive. So if you do a massive calorie deficit, it's like a sinking boat. You're going to remove the heavier things at first, right? That's muscle. So yes, the number on the scale is dropping, but a lot of it is muscle. So you just end up having a worse body composition. So we'd like to do things nice and slow and steady. That's why I take four months per 20 pounds. So if it's 40 pounds, it's eight months, right? Kind of, I just add on to that rule. We can go faster, a little bit faster, but I always tell people I need hundred percent compliance on it, which is not realistic, right? All the people I've coached, no one's ever had a perfect journey. We, I know that we have all the best intentions, but you know, we had to remember her house got struck by lightning and her kitchen burned down. Like you just can't plan for this stuff, right? <laughs> oh so I had to change her meal plan to like no cook meal plans and oh didn't have a stove anymore. You know, so you can't plan for these things. So wow. we take some, we take our time just to make sure that it's sustainable because if it's too tight of a timeline and you slip up, you're like, oh, I screwed up the whole thing. Let me just throw mm -hmm. in the towel. Right. So I want, I want time. Mm -hmm. So fat loss, that's how we do it. And then we do something called reverse dieting which we speed up the metabolism post-transformation. I don't do, I don't let anyone work with us without doing this process mm. because the stats in North America are 95% of people put the weight back on six months a year after losing it, which is pretty terrible, right? You just spend all this effort for nothing. Yeah. So best way to explain reverse dieting is, you know, when you do, a, you're at, at the end of your fat loss phase, metabolism slows down. So let's just use the analogy of a small fire, right? How do you make a small fire bigger? You don't throw a big log of wood on it. It can't handle it, right? And by the time that it does, it took a lot of time. So same thing, when people are done their fat loss, old lifestyle slowly creeps back up and then it's more energy coming in that their body's used to. And it goes like, yes, let's store this for the future because we don't know when's the next time we're going to be in the desert, right? Mm -hmm. And then most people store back on more weight than they actually lost. So how do we make a small flame bigger efficiently? You throw smaller pieces of wood on it over time, right? And it grows, it grows, it grows. Eventually you can throw a log, eventually you can throw a house in there and it'll burn the whole thing. Right. So reverse dieting is where we slowly and methodically re-add calorie intake mm. on a weekly basis, depending on how your body's responding. Mm. So sometimes it could be 25 calories, sometimes 50, sometimes 100. Very much depends on the individual and it changes from week to week. Right. Mm. But we're basically tricking your body into being able to process more food without storing it. So if I give you an extra banana per day, one week, it's 100 calories. It's not a lot. And what is your body going to do with it? Is it going to store it or use it because it's in deficit? going to use it, right? Because it wants the energy right away. So it's not going to have anything to store. So that takes about four months to do. The faster you go, the more weight you put on, which is what most people do. The longer you go, the better it is, but it's not sexy for most people that are for a long period of time. So 
for four months, the stats that we have, at least for us with 600 plus people is 80% of the time, people stay the same weight as we had a thousand plus calories of food intake. 10% oh. of the time. Yeah, it's pretty significant amount of food you can add it's just because it's so slow over time. Right. 80%, they stay the same weight. 10%, some of them lose a little bit of weight, but it's pretty rare. The other 10% of the time is worst case scenario. Some people put on like a pound or two, but mm -hmm. a pound or two trade off a thousand plus calories on top of what you're eating is pretty significant. That's mm -hmm. a win. Like, give me, give me $1 and I give you a thousand. And that's kind of the exchange you're having with your pot. So that's reverse dieting. So we lose a weight, we speed up the metabolism. Now what most people do after they're done for usually for coaches, they're like, oh, great, Lori, you're done. Ciao, have fun. Now you fall into reality, right? Which is I got to take care of my training. I take care of my nutrition. I have to be self-accountable. No one's checking in on me. So what I found throughout the years is it's better to have support post programs. So we offer free, pro free support post program for members. And um, I'm going to show this analogy. You've heard, seen the movie Karate Kid before? Mm -hmm. Of course. I'm right? from, I grew up in the, I, I, was, I was born in the 70s. So of course. <laughs> I, just, I just had a call with someone that was, she was 47 and she what? didn't hear a Karate Kid. I was like, what? So yeah, Are my favorite you? analogy, but... <laughs> So, you know, Mr. Miyagi wax on, wax off. Oh, yes. A hundred percent. So, right. You're learning to kind of like block and strike and do all these things. That's the program. There's, mm -hmm. we're, we're giving you a meal plan, showing you how to structure your nutrition. You're doing your workout. We're explaining to you why we're making the changes that we're doing because we're trying to create a self-sufficient person that doesn't need to rely on us. Like, hey, here's how we're doing it. So you understand for the next time. Mm -hmm. And that's wax on, wax off. Once you're out of the program, what most people do is they let them go on their own. Now mm -hmm. it's your first real fight with life. You know how to block, you know how to strike. You've never been punched in the face yet, right? You've never <laughs> had to because your coach was blocking everything. So instead of letting our members have their first fight on their own, yeah. we put a coach in the corner because all we're trying to do is get you to win that first fight, to build your confidence up, to be like, oh, I can actually do this on my own. And then you can go into the world. Mm -hmm. So we offer that post-program support until you win that first fight. So we check in on you weekly. There's daily texting. There's all that thing. We just slowly remove the training wheels. So you win that first fight. And then you're good to go on your own, basically. Mm. So that's kind of how I st structured everything. That's fantastic. Oh, my goodness. So basically, I love all of this. Um, where should I go? I guess my number one question I think people will have is the reverse dieting. Was this something that you learned or you came up with yourself? Like, where is that? Because that's, I've not heard it. And I feel like I've talked to a lot of different people. This is fabulous. I love yeah, this. Yeah, so I... I would love to take credit for it because it's a great concept, but uh, it comes from Dr. Lane Norton. Dr. Okay. Lane Norton, he's been promoting reverse dieting for well over a decade now. He comes from the, the fitness competitor bodybuilding world of competition okay. where yeah. you have to go to severely low amounts of calories and then most people end up putting all the weight back on. So he kind of like through his studies kind of found this process. And, and honestly, it's one of the only ways that I know that exists to speed up the metabolism post-transformation. Um, mm. and it's done wonders for our members. So Dr. Lane Norton is who, uh, I think it, I think he came up. That's who I learned it from over a decade ago, but maybe okay. it came from someone else before him. No, no, I think that's fabulous. Excellent. And then, so the, the entire process is from most likely four to 12 months working with you and your team. Um, uh, I would say minimum, it tends to be eight months ish, eight months. because most people that come with us want to do like a 15 to 20 pound body recomp, which that's okay. four months right there, right. four months of reverse dieting. So they're eight months and then the rest is free. So there's several months after, but that's free. That's included, but it's okay. them kind of moving into their own. So usually minimum, you're looking about eight months because yeah, we want to use a sustainable method, right? right? I don't want anyone to have the feeling when they're done to be like, party, this was so hard. Let me just go eat whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> and then as far as when you get someone started, what is what does it look like for the workouts? Like, are they doing resistance training? How many days a week yep. typically? Like, what is, what do you, how do you deal with that with folks? For sure. So we do, uh, resistance training is one of the big components of it because if we're looking to build muscle, like, yoga and cardio won't offer that. They offer their benefits in other fields like cardiovascular, mobility, flexibility, which is very important and we do include, but strength training needs to be at the foundation of it. Mm -hmm. So strength training, AKA resistance training. I don't really care if you're using resistance man, you're in a gym, you're curling bags with books in them, you know, squatting your child, whatever, maybe we just want resistance against gravity is what we're looking for. <laughs> so we customize it to whatever equipment they have access to. So if they're at a gym, if they're at their home with bands, dumbbells, kettlebells, if they have nothing like minimum, we ask is resistance band. 
they're like 15 bucks on Amazon. We've had member lose like 50, 60 pounds just with resistance band. Wow. So equipment is, can be minimal to a full gym. Ultimately, the amount of days minimum that we ask is three because anything less than three for strength training, is not enough of a constant stressor to kind of force some progression into your body. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the highest we go, like, it depends on the person. Like we're training some Ironman athletes. We've trained some professional athletes. So it's a bit different because they make their living out of training. So mm -hmm. it's fully custom to the individual ultimately um, yeah. per person that comes in, but minimum three a week. Gotcha. Cool. And then I'm curious because people ask about your protein. So first of all, let's just address yeah. the big, you know, myth of protein on a whole food plant-based diet. And then you're having someone who's engaging in resistance training, wanting to build muscle recomposition. Yeah. Where does the macros, like what is your measurements and ratio? Cause like, these are questions people will be asking. <laughs> For sure. People, people like the numbers. Um, <laughs> so we try to keep the protein between 1.2 gram to two gram per kg of body weight. Okay. Right. Um, if you ever read the book, Robert plant-based athlete, the studies are all in there as well. We found great success with those rates. You know, coming from the bodybuilding background where it was one to two grams per pound of body weight, right? I was like 240 pounds. We can imagine I was eating four oh to 500 grams of protein, yeah. which was very unhealthy, but right. 1.2 gram to two gram per kg of body weight, a great place to be. Um, typically when we start a fat loss phase, we can be at the lower end of that because there's more carbohydrate, which, you know, the body will use instead of using, because when you're low in carbs, your body will start to convert some protein into carbohydrate it's a really shitty conversion. It's not a great source of energy. So it's better to have like more carbohydrates to protect the protein that you're consuming. So you don't need as much protein as most people think. And that is for an individual that is active, that is actively looking to improve their body composition. Mm. And then you can go in lower, you can go slightly lower in terms of your protein and take below that 1.2, right? I think 0 0.8 gram is like the big one. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to just be healthy, you don't really care too much about body composition. You can be healthy on that. There's nothing wrong. It's just if the emphasis is body recon, because we're being physically active, we do need slightly more and within that range that I kind of mentioned. Mm. Okay. And then when you have these folks who are wanting to build muscle, so they're adding more protein, do you feel like they're being able to get enough? I guess it will also depend on the person and their, their weight and what their needs are. Yeah, yeah. When do you find that you're adding in like a healthy whole food, you know, maybe a protein powder? What do you, would you recommend those type of things? Yeah. So we always like, trying to, we always put like one scoop of protein powder for most people per day in a smoothie, just because a smoothie is such a great way to get more nutrients in, in a jam packed way versus having to eat like a, you know, a king size Buddha bowl. So it's an easier way. And it gives a little bit of flavor to it. And we also want to look because we're monitoring calories. We don't get our members to track their food. We do all the work for them in the recipes that we give them. We make sure that all the recipes match where we want them to be. So they only have to follow it. Like it's a recipe book ultimately. Mm. So they don't have to track. But because we're trying to stay within a certain amount of calories, depending kind of where they're at in their journey, again, how tall they are, how much weight they want to lose. In terms of calorie cost per gram of protein, protein powder tends to be one of the most efficient ones. Mm -hmm. So we do make it a small component of the whole thing because mm -hmm. there's there's grains, there's beans, there's lentils, there's tofu, there's tempeh, there's all these other sources mm -hmm. included in it. But it is handy to have a little bit of it, especially mm -hmm. if you're physically active. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, for sure. I totally can understand that. And then, um, which is there brands or anything that you prefer or recommend for people? Yeah. So, well, I do have, um, I've searched around for a long time. There's a lot of protein powder that don't taste that great yeah. <laughs> and that aren't like that healthy. So one that I've kind of stumbled upon is veg nutrition. Um, yeah. they're based out of the United States somewhere. Um, they have a really, really good protein for people that are a little bit iffy on the protein because it's not necessarily whole food plant based. I always recommend eating hemp protein. Um, I used to work in the hemp space, like hemp protein is basically you grab hemp seeds, you cold press them, the oil that comes out is the hemp oil, the meal that's left over is hemp protein, that's literally what it is, that's crushed hemp seeds automatically, mm -hmm. so it's as close to whole food source as you get um, right. from a protein powder. Oh, that's really good to know how it's done, excellent, okay, cool, and then um, I know we're, I want to be conscious of your time and everything here, but uh, we can, where can people find you? And we'll have links as well, but where are the best, way, best ways people can connect with you? Yeah, for sure. Honestly, at this point, there's so many platforms, whichever you prefer <laughs> is best. But if you go on fitvegan.ca, you have the link to my Fit Vegan podcast, which I would love to have you on as well. Oh, awesome. um, we have YouTube channel, Instagram page is where I'm most active daily on there. 
uh, and then there's a few other resources that are on a page, but everything is linked on top in the corner right side. So just picking your platform of choice. Um, and if people want to work with us, it's pretty straightforward. When they go on the page, it'll invite them to book a call. And it's with me directly, the call. I don't have anyone else take these calls, um, at least for now, because it's manageable. Um, but yeah, so we'll get to chat and see kind of like where you're at, what you want to accomplish and see if it's a good fit. Because sometimes I just like, you I, you need a doctor. Like <laughs> you don't need to focus on this. You need a doctor right now, mm. right? Or maybe they're just not in the right headspace. And I'd rather be upfront of like, hey, it just, I just don't feel that you're ready right now um, mm. and being upfront with them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. No, I think that those are excellent resources and ideas. And um, I love that you're interviewing them, determining if you need a doctor, <laughs> come back to us after you see them. Because a lot of times people, yeah, they, they need to get their, their ducks in order before they, they move on. So I appreciate that. Um, excellent. Well, everyone check it out. It's at fitvegan.ca um because you are canadian but you're now in los angeles so we would definitely have to meet in person as well um and yes. so everyone take a look and listen we're on youtube and all your podcasts of course you guys know where to find us and thanks again for being on the podcast we really appreciate your time today yeah thank you very much for having me and offering me the opportunity to share yeah absolutely thanks for watching and i hope you enjoyed that video before you go though, please hit the subscribe and alert buttons so you don't miss out on any of the amazing content we're working so hard to provide you. We upload a new episode of Health & Mora with Dr. Lori Marbus every Friday. Now, if you'd rather listen to the podcast, you can find us on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. If you're looking for amazing resources to help you start and sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, or anything wellness, we got you covered there too. Because at Mora, we actually provide physician-led support groups to help people live happier, healthier lives free of metabolic disease. Don't forget to check out our website at mora.com. And thanks again for watching.